Hello and welcome to this week's IG Live today. I am excited to be talking to author Anna Orenstein Cardona and we are going to be talking about her book Tree of Hope and this is an incredible story based on a true story of a tree in Puerto Rico that was uprooted but then restored um, after Hurricane Maria. So we are going to be talking about that. Let me get her on. Team, we appreciate all of your support and we work hard to bring you some really great interviews and this is part of our Hispanic Heritage Month series. Hello. Hola, hola. Hello. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us and I just want to acknowledge that we are joining with a big time difference. It's actually, I'm in California, so it's noon here for me and I believe it's about eight o'clock at night for you in the That's UK. Right. I, I just landed back in the UK on Tuesday morning, so I'm a little jet lagged, but so it's 8 p.m. here, but I'm super happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, th thank you so much for joining us. And why don't we just jump in and you can introduce yourself and then tell us what was your journey to becoming an author? Absolutely. Absolutely. So hello and thank you so much to everyone who is joining and those that will watch this later. So my name is Anna Orenstein Cardona and I have a very interesting author journey because it is quite different from the typical, let's say, um, author um, many times that happens. And I'm a big believer and this is a fundamental core belief that anyone can follow their dreams. Sometimes the timeline at which it happens is a little bit longer or decades later, as in my case, but follow your dreams and never give up. So I started basically writing stories since a child. I've always been a super creative person. I loved um, making up stories. I remember as a child, I was glitter girl and my brother was the evil enemy and we would like have pretend fights and I would write stories about that and many different things. And, you know, as life has it, and I'll never forget my beautiful grandfather, um, may he rest in peace, he said to me, Anna, write your stories down, they're good. And so that was my first initiation into thinking, I can create stories, wow. But the truth is that, um, you know, when you are a child growing up in Puerto Rico as a career to become a children's author is not a very common thing that you see, especially back, you know, 40 plus years. And it wasn't something that even like I remember being discussed at school. So it's really interesting how now it's becoming more, um, you know, author visits are becoming more of a thing and things like that to expose children to, to other types of careers where you can use your creativity. But in a nutshell, I um, was a very studious child as well. And so I knew that um, growing up in Puerto Rico and seeing my parents as well struggle financially, I said at the age of 10, I'm going to help them and I'm going to buy their first home. And so that really pushed me and motivated me to study hard. And I went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where I studied brain and cognitive sciences. Mm -hmm. And again, the stories never left me, but see, creativity helps you in all aspects of your life. And so does storytelling. I just use them in another capacity, which was doing research. Mm -hmm. And at MIT, another pivot happened to me where I realized, wow, if I want to continue my journey to become a doctor, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to incur a lot of debt right? Because I had my student loans from undergrad, even though MIT is very gracious and gave me a good financial aid package. I remember thinking, gosh, I can't accomplish my dream of helping my parents and buying their first home um, if I go down that pathway. And so when I was a senior at MIT, I decided to, um, to go into Wall Street. And I spent almost 23 years between New York and London working in the world of finance on investments but I never gave up on my dream. I studied creative writing at Faber Academy. I joined the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI, which is a great global organization. And I got to learn what publishing was, what children's books were. And so that's another nugget of wisdom, I think, about my journey that I can share with people is again, pivoting is okay in life, you know? And so I immerse myself to understand, okay, what does it take to become a children's author? And I continued writing stories on the side and querying, which is the process of trying to find an agent and eventually a publishing house. 
And in 2020, September 15th, I um, pitched my idea in Latinx Pitch. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about this amazing organization later. But that's how I found my wonderful editor, Naomi Kruger from Beaming Books. And I got my first um, book deal. So it's a very different. So thank you to social media. I got a publishing deal. <laughs> I love that. But I love that you, through all of these changes and different paths, that you always kept this creative spark alive and didn't give up on it. Uh, I mean, that's such a great story because I think a lot of people think, oh, it's too late. You know, I had this other career. I gave up on that. But the, you really kept that going. And, and now here you are, published author. It's amazing. And why don't you Thank tell you. us about that book, The Tree of Hope? I know it's inspired by the beloved banyan tree in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and especially what happened after Hurricane Maria. Um, <clears throat> you said that when you heard the news that the banyan tree had been uprooted, and I should say it's not just any banyan tree. I mean, it's one that was very celebrated, this old tree. You said it was like losing a childhood friend. Um, what is that significant? Maybe tell us a little more about the tree and what it means in Puerto Rico. Absolutely. So the Hague Blanco, which in English is the banyan tree, is a type of fig tree. And it's not only located in a very, very historically important point for a lot of us in Puerto Rico, it's next to the San Juan Gate, which is the only functioning gate that is nowadays used in old San Juan, which is in Spanish, La Ciudad Amurallada, which means that there is a wall that was constructed by the Spanish when we were um, a colony of Spain to protect it from pirates and other people from invasion, right? So not only is it a historically significant location, it's also right next to the governor's house in, in Puerto Rico. And I have an interesting tidbit on that later. Mm -hmm. But it was over a hundred years old and is now over a hundred, um, I'd say it's almost 122 years old now. So you can imagine the beauty of banyan trees is that their aerial roots grow down into the ground and the trunk expands. Mm -hmm. However, this banyan tree was in almost like a planter. So it was contained almost like a bonsai, but majestic in nature. It weighed over 50, no, 30,000 pounds and was 50 feet in height. So it was just a very special place um, where people gathered from townsfolk. There were proposals that were done there. Generations bring their children to visit the tree, get piraguas, which are our snow cones under the tree, to rest. It was a spot of entertainment, of love, of singing and lullabies. And so I remember when um, I found out about the banyan tree was, so we got hit on the 17th of September, 2020 by Hurricane Maria. For those that are not aware, it was some people say a category four to um, so other people debate it to category five. The winds were over 150 miles per hour, which is a category five. The worst part of Hurricane Maria is that it was a slow moving hurricane. It moved at 10 to 12 miles per hour, whilst most hurricanes go around 18 miles per hour. So it was um, very slow, meaning that the damage was significant for longer periods of time. We lost power, meaning no electricity no running water, schools were shut, businesses were shut for months. This was not a few weeks, this was months. We lost over 4,000 people. Sorry, I get a bit emotional because it was really something. Mm -hmm. But I remember, so it was around November when I read this newspaper article in Primera Hora that showed the majestic banyan tree on the floor and how they were trying to save it. And I literally was just like, it was, you know, the lap, how do you say the needle that broke the camel's back? I was just like, my family had suffered. My home had suffered. My friends, um, I'm very involved in animal rescue. A lot of the centers were devastated. So I was involved with a lot of things. And all of a sudden I was like, no, the banyan tree that survived every single hurricane for the last hundred years and hurricane Maria, literally lifted it up from the ground and it drowned in the ocean. So this story of how some growth was found on it and it was rescued and saved, I was like, this is a story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. But at that time I was devastated and I, my book became my portal of healing from grief. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, and I think it's such a beautiful way into 
talking about the hurricane uh, in a way that's maybe a little easier for kids to understand. Like you said, there was so much devastation, so much human tragedy that maybe is, is a little hard to talk about with kids, but when you focus on the tree, that's kind of a way into talking about this tragedy. But it really, like you said, it's a tribute to the spirit of the people of Puerto Rico that had been through so much, and yet the community really came together to, to save the tree. What, what do you hope readers take away from reading the book? So I hope that readers take away the power of the individual is leveraged when more people get involved. And mm -hmm. so in the, in the book and how I, so it's really interesting just to give you a bit of background. I wrote the story before the end of December 2017 and kind of put it aside because it's a very emotional period. As I say, I had to deal with a lot of personal circumstances um, in Puerto Rico. And I remember I had been trying to search for the gentleman leading the mission, mm -hmm. Pedro J. Morales, since 2017. And I didn't find him till 2020 to be able to interview to get a lot more detail about the rescue. Because one thing is to read about it, but the other is to interview the people involved, such as such as him that was helping to lead it. And so, you know, the and he described in the process of rescuing the tree, you know, all the technical side of it, but also the emotional side. People literally would come visit the tree every day. Since we had no running water, there was no way to get water down to where the tree was located. So people would come with their precious water that they saved in bottles to water the tree. People held vigils, prayed and danced for the tree to recover because in a way its recovery was, was that spark of hope, right? It was the community coming together to say, we can at least, we can't control when we're gonna get water back. We can't control when we're gonna get electricity or food or help, but we can control our actions. And they decided to get together to help to save the tree. And I just thought that was such a beautiful symbol of my people because we never give up, right? We have been faced with, you know, everything from colonization, everything to, you know, you know, from racism to natural disasters, which are sadly with climate change. And I know that's a, a very important topic that we um, are talking about in general because hurricanes are getting worse. And I was even, as I was preparing for our chat today, I was thinking, gosh, I don't remember as a child being so petrified between the months of May to end of October, which is the high season for hurricanes. I never even gave it a thought. And now because of climate change and the increase in hurricanes, I think about it all the time. And when I go to visit children, my message is not one of being scared of the hurricane, but it's about preparing. Because when you are able to prepare for things in life, you can face them, you can unite, you can help others. So, um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, when it goes back to when you were talking to, when you're presenting to children about being prepared, I think mean, another lesson that this book teaches about finding strength during difficult times, yeah. which, you know, teaching kids how to be resilient, how to get, how to persevere in difficulty. Why is that such an important lesson to teach kids? so important oh wow on so many levels so i think one of it is that we simply cannot control what happens in life either with nature or outside of nature right when you can teach resilience to children and to prepare you take the fear away from the equation and you help to build their spirits so something very interesting um when my book came out last august and in september i spent the month in puerto rico doing school visits mm -hmm. And when I was there, Hurricane Irma hit. And so some of those school visits got canceled, but this is why it's so interesting. When I went to visit the children, one of the first things I ask is, who here knows about Hurricane Maria? A lot of them, you know, again, Hurricane Maria hit us in 2017. So a lot of the children that I see sometimes are younger, right? Then they should really comprehend and having lived there. Some of them would be, I was in my mom's belly. Yeah. But everyone knows Hurricane Maria is a character now in our history, a sad character, but a character that showed us that what we're built of, right? And so then I asked them, and who here has lived through a hurricane? And we had just been through Hurricane Irma because my author visits got rescheduled. And so all of them were raising their hands. And for them to share their experiences, 
I could see helped them to decrease their fear. They now knew what they could do. It also showed me the societal differences between children that go to certain schools because when I would ask, what do you do to prepare for a hurricane? Some of them would be like, turn on the generator. And others were like, get a battery for my flashlight. You know, and so you see the differences there. And so the more we talk about this, the more we prepare children. And again, in a world where we don't know when an earthquake can hit, when a fire can hit, like prayers to my people of Hawaii and what they've been through. You know, we we need to prepare children to view things in order to get fear decreased, but take action and intelligent, thoughtful processes, you know, to, to bring that reaction into life and knowing. So for instance, with my book, I have um, a teacher's guide, which again, if anyone is interested, just reach out where it's teaching children all about what hurricanes are, how to prepare for them, how, what to do during a hurricane and what to do after. So it's really important, I think, to be prepared in today's world of unknown. Right, definitely. And, and it also speaks to the idea that of the importance of having these stories out there, having a diversity of, of voices and talking about different experiences. Um, I'm sure it was really special for the children that you visit in Puerto Rico to have somebody telling the story that came from their community, which brings us back to what you mentioned earlier about Latinx pitch and also Las Musas. And programs like these are really trying to increase the diversity and publishing. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience and why is it so important to have programs like those? Absolutely. So um, Latinx Pitch, again, for those that may not know what it is, it's, it's an, um, an organization that's made up of volunteers that came together to say we need to promote Latinx writers and Latinx is basically Latinos and Hispanics, right? And Las Musas is a group that came uh, that again volunteers got together to support debut Latina authors. And why is this so important? It's because actually when you look at statistics, a quarter of children in the US in the population is Hispanic. Mm. Okay. If you look at the southwest part of the US, it's over 40%. These statistics are going up, yet only 5% of children's books or books for young readers are written by or represent a Latinx person or um, figure. So you can imagine these numbers are not, not um, in Spanish to say cuadrando, they don't add up. Right. So it's so important for organizations like Latinx Pitch, for Las Musas, also I'm part of Picture Book Raising Stars. I just graduated from their amazing mentorship program. And I'm so grateful for these people that came before me and that stepped up and said, now we got to help them. And it's beautiful. We're such a, a, a wonderful sisterhood and brotherhood of, of creators of our culture and heritage where our children deserve to see themselves and our beautiful histories in the books. And Love that. And, and I, I love that thanks to these programs, we're getting to see wonderful stories like yours out there. Are you working on a second book? Do you have other ideas that you've got it coming out? Oh, oh, thank you. Absolutely. I have so many ideas. <laughs> um, so I literally am part of the, the mentorship I just went through was to polish up some of my manuscripts. And now I'm preparing to query for agents because I've been blessed that I was able to get published, which again is another sometimes rarity without an agent and so now i'm working on getting an agent to represent the different works um one of the books i'm doing it's about learning to deal in a positive way with grief from the perspective of a child um, i think another very important topic that needs to be out there in the world more as well as relationship between intergenerational and and also multilingual families and uh, fun adventures of um Another book that I'm working on is actually middle grade and it's adventures of a feline superhero secret agents um, from the Caribbean. So there's a few things in the pipeline. So fingers crossed those come into the world. Well, we will keep an eye out for them. And if we see them, we will share them in our stories. And, you know, we're almost out of time. We don't have much left, but I want mm -hmm. you, I want to give you an opportunity to pitch the other side of your, of your business, I guess you could say, which people will see on your Instagram. I mean, the, your handle is wear your money crown. And I know that you, um, you do a lot to help with people financial wellness. You kind of mentioned a bit about that journey at the beginning, 
maybe you want to talk a little bit about what kind of resources you offer. I know that you were a speaker at that um, SCBWI virtual conference this summer about how creatives can um, can also look after their financial wellness. Why is that so important? Why is this such an so important issue to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So having been someone, as I said, that grew up in a humble background and built my wealth, I really was able to help my parents. I bought my parents a first home at 23, and that is something that I'm very proud of. And I was able to do that because I entered a world that taught me to be smart with money. And many times as creatives, we do not learn that at school. And for me, money enhances the goodness in you. It can also enhance the badness in you if you have that, but I like to be a positive person. And I believe that the more we can give good people money, the better this world will be. The better choices will be made, the more empowerment to females, to you know, underrepresented cultures and backgrounds. And so I um, work with individuals in providing financial wellness solutions through education. So either I work one-on-one -on -one with individuals to empower them on their personal finances. I work, um, I'm gonna be launching in October my Academy, which is an online and live group coaching program and course. I recently, as of 12, year, 12 months ago, started to work with corporates to offer financial wellness to employees. So if that's a benefit, you know, you work maybe for a company um, and you're looking for that. Uh, please reach out. But this is my point um, in general. Wealth is something that means something different for many people. But the truth is that the cornerstone of our well-being from mental to physical health really is also our money and finances, what we can afford and not afford to do with our health with our well-being, the jobs that we do, et cetera. But also as a creative, I can tell you that sadly, many times our work is not represented in quality of financial uh, remuneration. And I hope that is something that can change. But meanwhile, I am on a mission to help creatives to make money so that they can have the stability that empowers them to keep creating the beautiful books that they do um, and arts and all sorts of great um, forms of artistic celebration. So you can find a lot of information by visiting whereyourmoneycrown.com. And one of the reasons when I became a, a children's, a published children's author, I did not change my handle on purpose because for me, there can be an integration of our passions in life. And at the end, you can wear your money crown in your finances, in your writing, and in your creativity. I love that. Well, that's a great note to end on. And I encourage people to go to find about the resource about financial health and also the children's book, which is so beautiful. And thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. If anybody's joining us late, this will be up in just a few minutes on Instagram and later on our YouTube channel. Wonderful. Thank you. So great to meet you. Adios and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.